Hello, my name is John Sobrook. I'm a professor of genetics at Illinois State University, and I want to thank Mark Smith and the organizers for giving me this opportunity to discuss our work uh, in developing pennycress into the new oilseed cash cover crop for the Midwest. So first I'll talk about the attributes of pennycress as a model and a new crop, and uh, in particular talk about our efforts to domesticate and commercialize this new crop. And I want to thank the USDA and DOE for the support they've given that uh, made this work possible. So the Latin name for pennycress is Thalaspi arvins. Many of you may know pennycress as field pennycress. Uh, it is closely related to canola, camelina, carinata, and arabidopsis. It grows throughout temperate regions of the world, including uh, throughout Canada. It has extreme cold tolerance, a relatively short life cycle, and naturally produces uh, large amounts of uh, seeds rich in oil and protein. Uh, it's a uh, weed, but not a problem weed. It's not invasive, and uh, it's uh, been easy to work with genetically because it has a diploid genome. Uh, we have large natural populations that we've been collecting. I'll say a little bit about, and uh, my lab's developed a transformation method uh, similar to Camelina to uh, using agrobacterium to uh, genetically transform, which has allowed us to use CRISPR to rapidly improve this new crop. So here's what the pancreas seeds look like relative to uh, canola and camelina. So uh, pancreas seeds are about the same size as camelina uh, and have uh, uh, naturally have about the same amount of uh, oil and protein. And we've made some improvements to uh, oil and protein content already. And uh, I can imagine there's room to improve further. So throughout the U.S. Midwest Corn Belt, there's about 80 million acres of land that sits uh, empty from fall to spring. Uh, here's a view flying into Bloomington, Illinois, is where my university is, and you can see there's nothing on the fields here. And this is where we uh, are working to fit pennycress in, uh, launching in the lower uh, Midwestern uh, U.S. right about here. Uh, so this crop, uh, upon launch, which I'll say about in a second here, uh, produces about 1,500 pounds of seed per acre that have over has over a 200 uh, dollar per acre seed value, and our goal is to be on about uh, 2 million acres by 2030. And this is uh, work uh, being done in close co collaboration with uh, Covercrest Inc., which is a startup company in St. Louis that is uh, commercializing this crop called Covercrest. So uh, in terms of ecological benefits, uh, there, as many of you know, there's a large problem with uh, nutrient runoff from uh, these farm fields that uh, lay empty and uh, it's causing a dead zone within the Gulf of Mexico. And so planting cover crops, including cover crests, could help mitigate this problem. What keeps me up at night is the problems with uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, climate change. So. Uh, here's the amount of CO2 that's been increasing in the atmosphere, and there's a strong correlation with uh, rising temperatures. And uh, plants, uh, planting more plants, including cover crops, can help, help mitigate this. So this uh, CO2 concentrations are cyclical. You can see uh, during the summertime uh, in the northern hemisphere, CO2 levels are dropping. And uh, so planting more plants uh, can help bring this down more. So there is a growing focus on uh, carbon emissions and reducing them as much as possible. And so I'm happy to say that uh, techno-economic analysis of uh, cover crests has showed that the carbon intensity score will be very low. So this uh, should benefit uh, agriculture, uh, not only in uh, remo removing carbon from the atmosphere, but uh, displacing uh, the use of fossil fuels. So uh, this uh, is a slide showing the group of um, researchers, uh, both uh, academic and uh, government and industry that are working together under a USDA grant to commercialize Covercrest, which is domesticated pennycress, uh, within the next few years. Actually, uh, this fall was the first commercial planting of Covercrest. So here's uh, the, the picture of uh, some of the people working at Covercrest in St. Louis. Uh, here's some of their breeding plots. And uh, this is where the commercial launch area will be. Uh, there's 30 million acres in the lower Midwest. Uh, so I should point out that the breeding program was being led by uh, Mark Mesmer, who actually led the corn breeding program for Monsanto for a number of years. 
So uh, this uh, crop, along with the ecological benefits I mentioned, ha could have uh, pretty large uh, economic benefits as well. So uh, if it's planned on 30 million acres, which I think it uh, eventually can get to, uh, in the U.S. alone here, uh, it could be producing as much as 3 billion gallons of oil annually, along with 20 million uh, metric ton tons of meal. And so that oil can be used for generating biofuels, for feed and food and the meal uh, for feeding animals and eventually for human uses as well once going through the regulatory approvals. Uh, and just uh, one example of the market, uh, commercial aviation in the U.S. alone uh, consumes 20 billion gallons of jet fuel annually. Uh, globally, it's uh, about 100 billion gallons. So in order to become carbon neutral by 2050, there uh, needs to be uh, solutions for uh, burning fossil fuels and uh, uh, these oil-based fuels, as you know, are one of the few that are energy dense enough to uh, fit that bill. So uh, here's a list of some of the, the uh, core traits of Pennycrest that we've been working on in its domestication. Uh, as you know, for uh, canola, the two traits that uh, make canola canola is uh, low rusic acid content and reduced um, uh, glucosinolate content. Uh, we've also reduced the seed coat fiber, which I'll show some data on that and on the oil compositional improvements. And uh, essentially we've made improvements to all of these uh, traits here, but I only have time to, to talk about a few. Let me first say a few words about the breeding program that uh, this is being led by Covercrest. Uh, there's a breeding program that they are doing as well as one in the University of Minnesota. So they started this program in uh, 2015, and uh, over the years, they've uh, gotten varieties that uh, are producing higher yields uh, to the point now, and, uh, last year in 2020, that had over 114 that were producing at least 1,500 pounds per acre. And they actually, this past year, had some that were producing 2,000 pounds per acre, uh, which is uh, promising. In this short period of time, we've gotten to a point where this uh, crop can be economical. So here's a, a planting, a pre-commercial planting uh, in central Illinois. Uh, this is the, the harvest uh, that occurred in uh, early June. And so this seed is now being planted for the first commercial planting that uh, those seeds will be used for poultry production. Uh, and once on enough acre, uh, likely the crop will be used for generating biofuels. So we've found some uh, natural variation with uh, some of the agronomic traits, but for the core domestication traits, there's limited variation. Uh, so we've resorted to doing mutagenesis. We're taking two complementary approaches. Uh, EMS mutagenesis, we've made large uh, populations uh, and sequenced those, as well as have employed uh, CRISPR gene editing. Uh, the uh, mutagenesis with EMS is beneficial in finding partial loss of function and for doing exploratory. Uh, CRISPR really uh, um, has the be benefit of being able to uh, have clean backgrounds, such as uh, only one mutation which you're targeting instead of the many mutations that occur in background of EMS. Uh, plus, with CRISPR, you can stack uh, traits together very rapidly. So, in terms of uh, EMS mutagenesis, having a number of uh, so-called background noise mutations. Uh, here are, are just a few of the, the phenotypes that we've identified in our EMS mutant populations. Uh, and so, you know, why we are finding uh, beneficial agronomic uh, trait mutations, uh, it's a, it takes a while, as you know, to, to clean up those backgrounds. Uh, so we uh, really, the, all of the different traits that we've looked through uh, or looked for in uh, uh, the EMS populations we've identified, uh, so because we have large uh, mutant populations, which are sequence index, and uh, if anyone is interested in collaborating on this, uh, just uh, let us know. Uh, we've published a paper on uh, some of these EMS mutants that uh, uh, benefit uh, ag agronomic traits from uh, reducing seed pod shatter to reducing glucosinolate content uh, to improving the oil composition. You can uh, see this paper in Nature Food, uh, published in 2020, Chopra et al. So the next number of slides will focus on our CRISPR gene editing work. Uh, for those that are not familiar with CRISPR, it's a really simple uh, 
uh, procedures. So the machinery consists of an enzyme, an endonuclease that cuts DNA, and that endonuclease gets targeted to uh, specifically where you want to introduce those mutations by a so-called guide RNA. The guide RNA binds to the enzyme. Uh, you design the guide RNA to target uh, the gene of interest, and uh, the enzyme keeps cutting the DNA. And uh, while the cell repairs it, uh, most of the time it does make a mistake every now and again, and that introduces uh, typically an indel mutation, like a small insertion or deletion. And uh, after the mutation is introduced, you can uh, uh, segregate away the transgenic uh, CRISPR machinery, and you end up having a plant that's non-GMO. Uh, so we've used CRISPR, CRISPR to uh, reduce the rusic acid content of uh, pancreas seed oil and also to uh, increase the oleic, oleic acid content. Uh, here's the fatty acid profile of uh, pancreas seed oil, uh, wild pancreas, so it has about 35% rusic acid. Uh, so rusic acid uh, has anti-nutritional uh, properties. So uh, targeting this uh, single gene here, fatty acid elongase 1, we demonstrated uh, abolish these uh, very long chain fatty acids uh, to the point where we now have a fatty acid profile uh, similar to canola. Uh, actually, there's more polyunsaturated fatty acids with the single uh, mutation. So we've actually stacked in uh, another mutation uh, to increase the oleic acid content, and we're working to increase uh, this amount of oleic acid even higher with other genetic combinations. Another high priority target was reducing the seed coat fiber content, and uh, this mutation that I'll be talking about here uh, has a number of agronomic benefits. It uh, reduces seed coat fiber content, impro improves uh, or reduces seed dormancy, and also increases the oil and protein. So the seed coats of brassica seeds uh, are synthesized in part by a pathway of so-called transparent testogenes, which uh, produce secondary cell wall components, including uh, condensed tannins. Uh, so condens condensed tannins are uh, polymers of proanthocyanidins, which are uh, phenolic polymers, and uh, they give the seed coat its dark brown color. And uh, we've made mutations throughout uh, this path pathway, including regulatory genes, to uh, reduce uh, condensed tan formation to now the pennycress uh, seeds that are being commercialized have this golden color. So following are some data from uh, CRISPR targeting of this gene called transparent testa 8. Uh, transparent testa 8 is a transcription factor that is a positive regulator of condensed tannin formation and a negative regulator of fatty acid biosynthesis. So here are examples of some of the mutations that we introduced with uh, CRISPR. Uh, typically, you get a single base or a few base insertion or small deletions, and uh, most of these are frame shifts, which uh, result in a knockout of gene function. And this single transparent TESA-8 uh, mutation alone has reduced the acid uh, detergent fiber contents, uh, the endodecimal fiber content by about 45%, uh, increase uh, protein content as well as, well as oil content. Um, so uh, it benefits a number of different agronomic traits. I won't show you other data we have that shows that um, this mutation improves seed germination as well. So uh, interestingly, I'm oh, sorry you can't see uh, this graph here, but uh, here's the uh, oil, total oil content of the transparent TESA-8 seeds, about 10% higher. Uh, the FAE1 mutations that I showed you actually reduce uh, total oil content by about 9%. And so uh, when you combine these, you actually get a little bit more oil than uh, wild type. And these transparent TESA-8 plants grow uh, just fine in the field. They're indistinguishable from wild type. So what we in Covercrest have done is uh, stacked these uh, mutations together that improve the core domestication traits. And uh, actually we can use uh, vectors that uh, can target the gene simultaneously uh, in one plant. And uh, so Covercrest is now putting these uh, traits into the top breeding lines as they are being developed. And uh, our lab and others have been focusing on uh, validating uh, new genetic changes uh, that may be uh, worth commercializing. 
Uh, so uh, complementary to that work is uh, the development of uh, future generations of uh, the crop uh, cover crests uh, with this uh, DOE funded project called uh, IPREP or Integrated Pancreas Resilience Project. So it's an inter interdisciplinary team uh, covering many institutions throughout the United States and our goal is to identify natural and induced mutations that improve the stress resilience of the crop. Uh, we're focusing on abiotic stress uh, uh, challenges, uh, including uh, drought. Uh, so this past year in Canada, as you know, there was a pretty severe drought. Uh, this is a picture taken a couple of years ago. We had uh, uh, drought conditions in the spring where it uh, made the plants uh, and not branch as much and flower early and stop uh, growing early. So uh, we're working to improve the water use efficiency. Um, uh, heat also is a problem. So uh, pennycrest, once it gets about, above about 32 degrees Celsius, becomes sterile. So actually we found natural uh, variation that uh, has higher um, heat tolerance. Uh, this plant really is amazing. Uh, pennycrest, it goes through freeze-thaw cycles and water logging. And anyway, we have uh, expertise and uh, people throughout the IPREP project uh, working on, on improving all of these uh, traits. So I've only been able to show you just a small fraction of what we've accomplished in uh, domesticating and commercializing pennycress over the past nine years. There's been a number of people involved and I very feel, uh, feel very fortunate to be part of this team and to have gotten uh, the DOE and USDA funding as along with uh, private funding and having Covercrest is such a wonderful partner in uh, this endeavor. Thank you very much.